lenses. The Scleral Lens Society supports public education that highlights the benefits and availability of scleral contact lenses. I just have a little um, pop-up here for you if you can kind of see on your menu to the right hand side there's a little button that says questions and if you pop that little button out you can actually type in a question and then I will be able to see it. I'm sure we'll have a lot of questions tonight I'll get to as many as I can but at the end there will be a list of questions that's emailed to the Scleral Lens Society and we will try to email back as many people as we can so if you have any questions please feel free to put those in the little box first I want to just thank our sponsors of the Scleral Lens Society without them these webinars would not be possible and all the other education that we provide to practitioners our first platinum sponsor is AccuLens, and they are the creators of the Maxim Scleral, the Comfort SL, and the EasyFit. Paragon Vision Sciences creates the Normalize and the ICD Scleral Lens. Visionary Optics creates the Jupiter, Europa, and the Alara Scleral Lenses. XL Contacts creates the Atlantis Scleral Lens. Blanchard Contact Lenses creates the One Fit for Normal Corneas, the One Fit Cone, and the MSD. And also Alden Optical, who creates the Zen Lens. We'd also like to thank our silver and bronze sponsors. So thanks to all of our sponsors. I know some of you are online tonight. Thanks for your support. We really appreciate it. Just a, one disclosure before we get started for the evening. I am not a billing expert like Clark Newman and John Runpakis. They are amazing optometrists. They know a ton about medical billing and coding. They do a lot of lectures about specialty contact lens billing and coding, and I am certainly not to their degree. This information is also from January of 2015. This is a repeat from the lecture from the Global Specialty Lens Symposium, so there may have be some items or prices that have changed since that date. The goals for today are to be able to build a scleral lens fit with materials step-by-step -step for some common vision insurances such as VSP, IMED, and Davis. I'll also show you how to build a scleral cover shell through Medicare and also describe the billing and reimbursement differences between the medical insurances and your vision insurances. Also identify some differences between vision insurance and medical insurance billing. And just please keep in mind, this is the interpretation that I have regarding the multiple conversations that I have had with different reps of these insurances. So I've spent a lot of time talking to other practitioners, a lot of other billing and coding experts, a lot of reps from these insurance companies, and what I am presenting tonight is a compilation of, of my knowledge from all of those items. So billing and coding, it really is a leading source of frustration for practitioners. And the reimbursement rates do vary drastically between insurance carriers. So oftentimes it's really difficult to get a clear answer on how to bill appropriately. Some, uh, a really good analogy I think is thinking of billing and coding the same way as taxes and accountants. So for instance, if you take your same tax documents, everything exactly the same, to different accountants, they interpret the information differently. So in some cases you might owe money, in some cases you might save money or get money back, in other cases you break even. And that's all with the exact same information that you're presenting to these different accountants. So I kind of think of billing and coding the same way. The, you know, we, we really wish there was just one clear-cut right answer, but it seems that that is not the case. 
Many vision insurances actually reimburse very well for scleral lens fittings and devices. And scleral lens fittings in general usually reimburse more than corneal gas perm fittings, custom soft lenses, and also hybrid lenses. Scleral lenses, not only the fittings, but the lenses themselves, usually reimburse more than a soft lens, corneal GP lens, and a hybrid lens. In conclusion, scleral lenses can be a huge profit source within your practice and be a very good source of revenue. Medical insurances can be more difficult to obtain the appropriate reimbursement, and I think this is where most of the frustration lies. If you accept many different types of medical insurance, it can become very tedious and time-consuming figuring out your patient's benefits. Some practices actually bill each visit to the insurance, and I'll talk more about this later. A lot of doctors ask me, well, how do you develop a scleral lens fee schedule? Well, scleral lens fitting fees are going to range from low to high, depending on the practitioner and the type of practice that you have. My advice would be to determine the amount of time that's going to be needed at each visit to develop a fee schedule. You have to consider the amount of time that is necessary for your consultation if you do consultations. You have to consider the amount of time you'll be spending at the scleral lens fitting and then also their dispense. And then also you have to think about the training. Is it going to be you as the doctor training the patient on how to take care of their scleral lenses or will it be a staff member that assists you? And then also, how much time are you going to need for the follow-ups, and how many follow-ups do you anticipate having for your scleral lens patients? You also have to consider the cost of supplies during each visit. If you're doing a consultation, consider maybe the special equipment that you need. Maybe you use topography, maybe a specular microscopy, things like this, and other special testing. Also during the fitting, you need plungers, maybe you use dental bibs or some other form of protection for their clothing, non-preserved saline, bioglow or sodium fluorescine, all these other things that you might be using. For the dispense and the training, you have to think of the, uh, the kit and all the equipment and supplies that you use. So for the training, are you giving them a kit that has multiple plungers? Are you giving them a lot of sodium chloride or non-preserved saline? And are you giving them other supplies to be successful? So you have to incorporate those costs into your fees as well. And then also what kind of supplies or testing will you need to be doing at the follow-ups? So considering the amount of time that the patient is allotted and the amount of doctor time with the patient, and the cost of supplies and special equipment, develop a fee schedule that is aligned with your chair time costs. And this is going to be very different between each practice. There's some of my friends that they see eight patients a day and their chair costs are very low, so they are able to offer lower prices. Other practices, their chair time is very high or the doctor is physically spending their, the entire time with the patient and doesn't have a lot of assistance from other people. In that, came, in that case, the fees are going to be increased as well. So just kind of calculate how much time and how much the cost of supplies will be and that will help you develop a scleral lens fee schedule for the fitting and the lenses themselves. Just a couple differences to note. With vision insurances, they usually incorporate the scleral lens fitting and the lenses into one lump sum. And that includes the lens fit, the lens dispense, and then all follow-ups within a certain time period, and then also the lenses themselves. So it's usually like a one lump sum. Whereas medical insurances will pay for the fitting as one charge, then the lenses as another charge, and then all follow-ups are billed as separate charges. So the way that these are billed are definitely different. And here are just some common codes and descriptions of commonly used items. 
92310 is the prescription of basically a um, corneal lens, and that is a bilateral code, so it's for both eyes. And this is not uh, including patients that are aphakic. So technically, scleral lenses would not really be used under this this fitting code because it's not technically a corneal lens, but I've run into the case where there are some insurances where they don't recognize a scleral lens fitting code, and so this is what I have to use. It's on their list of accepted codes. So in a rare case, you might have to use this code, even though technically you're not fitting a corneal lens. Also, 92072 is the fitting of contact lens for management of keratoconus, and that's their initial fitting. It is code except with Medicare, then it becomes a bilateral code. So if you have a patient with keratoconus, you have to use this code, especially if you're seeing them for the first time. 92313 is fitting of the contact lens of a corneal scleral lens. So this is usually the code that I use and most other practitioners use because it's the closest description of what we're doing. Technically, a lot of these fits that we are doing are not corneal scleral lenses. They're not, not touching the cornea and the sclera, but it's really the closest code that we have to, that makes sense. And the 92313 includes the fitting for both eyes. Make sure you write this code down. This is the code that you will want to be using for the actual scleral lens itself. It's V2531, which is described as contact lens, scleral, gas permeable, and that's per lens. There's also another code, which is V2530, but if you read, it does say gas impermeable, and technically all scleral lenses are hyper decay materials, so they really are truly a gas permeable design. So the V2531 is a more appropriate code to use. Here are just some examples, and I just threw some numbers in here for um, the ease of math. First, we'll just go through a, just, um, an example of vision insurance. So first we have the scleral lens fit for both eyes, and that would be the 92313 code. Let's say your fee is $200. Then we build the scleral lens device, the V2531, for the right eye and the left eye, both as separate charges. So then the total amount that you would bill to the vision insurance would be $1,000, and that would be one lump sum for all of the services and the lenses. So don't forget, this is the fitting, this is the dispense, these are all of your follow-ups within a certain time period. On the other hand, we have medical insurance. So the scleral lens fit will be the same code, 92313, and let's say you charge $200. You would build the scleral lens devices right and left separately once again. But then when you see them back for their dispense, you code that as another office visit. In most cases, it's the 99213 code level three office visit, and then any follow-ups that they come in with will also be under a 99213 in most cases. So as you can see, with medical insurance, you're actually billing every single visit that the patient comes in to see you as a separate visit. I know a lot of doctors like to do it this way. Um, the issue I have with this is that you're kind of banking on the patient coming in for multiple follow-ups um, in order to get reimbursed properly, and to me that mindset is not the best. Uh, however, there are some scleral lens patients that you have to carefully monitor them, so you are seeing them week after week or day after day depending on their condition, so maybe this is more appropriate. Um, but I think the vision insurance is, has a good way of kind of bundling up everything and they just give you insurance. Their criteria and the reimbursement rates are all very different. So you have to look at the patient's plan, see what's covered, what diagnoses are covered, 
what the plan covers, things like that. So you have to make sure that you look at each patient's plan individually. And even patients that have the same insurance, their plans might vary. Most all vision insurances will cover either glasses or contacts, but not both. This is also going to hold true for medically necessary contact lenses. So if somebody gets medically necessary contacts, they will not be able to get glasses during that same year, mostly. So if the patient has used their benefits for glasses or contacts this year, they won't be eligible for medically necessary contacts. So that's something really important because if you see a patient and you think they might need medically necessary contacts, make sure they do not use their insurance for glasses or other contacts because then they won't be eligible for the medically necessary contacts, which usually in the long run that's going to be the thing that will save them the most money is by using their insurance for medically necessary contacts. Now I'm going to go through how to build VSP step by step. Let's say you have a patient and you see them for their comprehensive exam and you determine they're a candidate for scleral lenses. Call VSP to find out if they're eligible for medically necessary contacts. If the patient is eligible, they will give you an authorization number. After you perform the contact lens fitting, log on to ifinity.com. And this is the website that you'll see here and just sign in with your username and password and then this will pop up. This little box is important so you'll just put the authorization number and click go and this is what will show up next. So now I'm going to blow up this area. So under the diagnosis and services so you input the date of service here, the exam type you can leave blank, the contact lens material type will be V2531 which is scleral gas permeable, and the contact lens reason will be necessary contact lenses, so these are medically necessary contacts. The services that you'll perform is 92313, which is the script and fit of the corneal scleral lens, and that's really the closest option that we have from the drop-down menu. The contact lens manufacturer, just put other because it's not going to be from the main soft lens manufacturers such as Alcon, Siba, um, Cooper Vision, etc. The brand, you can also put other. And the contact lens number of boxes, I usually just put two, that would be one per eye because technically they should be able to last about a year. And then for the modality, I say conventional about one year. This is something really, really important. You need to put the diagnosis in the box of what the medically necessary indication is. And in this case, I have 371.50 in that box, number one, and that is corneal dystrophy. And then I'm going to match those diagnosis codes in the bottom. What you do now is you actually click this button, which is calculate HICPIX, and then the, but the right pop-up that you see on the right-hand corner will show up. And it says, this claim has passed VSP's diagnostic criteria for necessary contact lenses. No additional pre-certification is required. That means that whatever diagnosis code you put in that box is eligible as medically necessary contacts. So once again, you're going to click that HICPIX, Calculate HICPIX button, and then the box will pop up letting you know that you have passed. Now let's go into this area. What I like to do is break them up into individual uh, fittings and individual lenses. 
the V2531 and then for the modifier I put right, the diagnosis code will match up to the diagnosis code that I have. And then you just put the charges in and the units. Then I put in the 92313 for the right eye, do the same thing for the scleral lens for the left eye, and then the fitting fee for the left eye. Make sure they all match up with that appropriate diagnosis or else you will not get paid properly. Then you will enter in your charges. So just enter in the charges that you have for each scleral lens and then how many units. Then you'll just scroll down and most of this information is already auto-populated with your patient's information, but you do have to click the gender, male or female, and then also on the bottom there, the tax ID number and the physician that is performing the services. This is extremely important and you need to highlight this and put sticky notes all over your computer and your billing person's computer, which is box 19. Do not forget this box. What you have to do is free text in this little box and it says scleral lenses. That's what you have to type and then the manufacturer is blank. So you have to make sure that you say that the type of lens is a scleral lens and then whoever is manufacturing your patient's lenses, you have to put that into box 19. If you leave this blank, they will reimburse you about half of your fees, which is very silly in my mind why that is, but it's happened to us before. So just make sure you put box 19 and make sure you put scleral lenses manufacturer is blank. Then you click the submit button at the top and then another pop-up will come up and it will say the order number for your patient and that has been sent to VSP and then do you want to continue and you just press OK. Another box will pop up that says the claim has passed VSP's diagnostic criteria for necessary contact lenses. Reports are available. Do you want to view the reports? I always click yes because we're still kind of on paper, but I also like to just have a physical copy that I entered the information in appropriately and so I can print that out for my records. And what I like to do is print out the CMS claims report. So it just kind of shows you what services that you build for, how much you build for, what the date was. You can just make sure that all the information was entered in correctly. Something to note though is on the part where it says box number 19, nothing is going to show up there even if you actually typed something in. So don't panic when you print this out and you see that that part is blank and you say, oh my gosh, I forgot box 19 you probably didn't forget box 19, it just doesn't show up, which is kind of silly, but uh, don't get nervous or scared, but it, that is just how it prints out. I'm not sure why. Just some tips for VSP. VSP pays for the type of contact lens fitting and the type of contact lens. As a general rule, VSP does pay higher for scleral lens fittings and scleral lenses compared to other modalities and other lenses. VSP also pays according to the diagnosis. They will pay more for what they determine to be more severe diagnoses. So sometimes, you know, you might have a patient that has a high amount of astigmatism or they have high myopia. Well, they're not going to pay nearly as much as someone that has keratoconus or a corneal transplant. This information is from January, so this may not be current, but it probably is very similar. These are the visually necessary contact lens specialty maximums. So if you build any of these diagnosis codes with the CPT codes that are listed above, they will pay you at the maximum rate if that is your charge. So I don't have descriptions on here, but a lot of these are um, corneal conditions such as corneal ulcer, corneal dystrophy, 
corneal degeneration, transplant, things like that. So definitely take a picture of this and you can kind of do your own research and kind of see what these correlate to. But these are really interesting and important to keep on hand. This is from um, also from January and this is from my state of Arizona. I think these rates do vary across the country. But as, I, as you can see for this specialty lens maximum, the V2531 code will pay $2,300 maximum and that's for the fitting and for the lenses. Now I'm going to go through IMED step by step how to bill IMED. So net, let's say you see the patient and then you determine that you think they're a good candidate for scleral lenses. We'll have your billing department call IMED and ask if the patient is eligible for medically necessary contact lenses. If they are eligible, they will give you an authorization number just like VSP does. Then you will print the medically necessary form fill out the form and then you fax it back to IMED. So this is a little bit different from VSP. VSP is all done electronically whereas IMED you actually have to fax this form back to a very specific phone number. This is what the sheet looks like when you print it off. It's just one page and we're going to go through the top portion first. Make sure that you have the right document, which is Medically Necessary Contact Lens Claim Form. You'll be filling out the patient information, just as you would with other claims. And then, of course, your subscriber information. And then don't forget to put the date of service, which is when you would be performing the fitting. And then also the authorization number that you obtained earlier. Next, we'll go through this little box. This is important also. If you see, it says medically necessary codes, and that includes the contact lens evaluation, the fit, the follow-up, and the materials. So IMED, when you are billing this, it is including the contact lens evaluation, fit, follow-ups, and materials. So don't forget that this is another bundled fee. I'll just kind of go through the top four ones. These are the ones that I personally use the most. The bottom ones, the bottom four, uh, are for pediatric patients, and these are only for certain California insurances. And uh, so the most common ones that we might do are the anisometropia, high amotropia, keratoconus, and vision improvement. And I'll just kind of go through these two because these seem to be the um, most commonly used. Something to note for keratoconus, this is kind of silly, but it only reimburses $1,200 for services and materials. However, the latest scleral lens that I fit for a patient that had keratoconus, it actually separated this box into mild to moderate keratoconus where they will reimburse up to $1,200 for services and materials. And then they also have a moderate to severe box of keratoconus in which they will pay up to $2,500 for services and materials. I am not sure what classifies keratoconus as mild, moderate, or severe. I don't think there's really any guidelines of what qualifies in, in the handbook, but they have changed it so it's not just one fee of this $1,200. They kind of have divided it up depending on if the patient has mild keratoconus or more severe keratoconus. This is an interesting one. Vision improvement, this can be used if your patient does not have keratoconus and it's for patients where you can correct their vision by two lines or more on the visual acuity chart and that will reimburse up to $2,500 for services and materials. So a lot of patients that I use this for are patients that have um, maybe they have RK surgery, so they're, they have a lot of irregular astigmatism and they can't get better than maybe 2050 or 2060, but with scleral lenses they can achieve 2025. In this case, they would certainly qualify for that code. 
And then on the bottom, you just put your usual and customary fees, and that's for the scleral lens fitting component. And then on the bottom, that's where you will put the materials. So what we're going to do is check the box that says V2530 to V2531, and then you will just also enter your usual and customary fees for the actual scleral lens devices themselves. Last, I'm just going to go through Davis Vision, and I'd just like to make a note that um, I know a lot of optometrists are kind of turned off by Davis and Spectera insurances because of their poor reimbursement rates for exams and then their dispensing fees uh, for glasses and things like that. However, I have found that Davis and Spectera are usually quite good at um, reimbursing for medically necessary contacts, so please keep that in mind. So you may not want to kick them to the curb just yet um, if they can help you with some of these medically necessary contacts. So same thing, you'll call Davis to find out if they are eligible for medically necessary contacts. If they are eligible, you'll just simply fill out the one-page letter and then you send it to Davis Vision. There's an actual optometrist that reviews it and it will and they will make edits to your fees possibly and then they will confirm the total that they are willing to give you as a provider for the lenses and the services. And this is something unique. You can't submit this form until after you have performed the fitting. And this is what the form looks like. And let's just go through the top portion. So make sure you have the correct form. It's the prior approval medically necessary services request form. And similar to prior, you'll be putting in the patient information and the provider information. And then the services requested. I usually just click the contact lens evaluation and the contact lenses. And then the diagnosis or reason for services. So you've got your keratoconus, uh, post-cataract, anisometropia, and your other high myopia, diabetes, and other. A lot of times I actually do click other because it's an irregular astigmatism that doesn't fall under those categories, and it's usually approved. I also really like to support, to add some supporting documents. So a lot of patients, I will write a letter explaining in layman's terms what happened at the at the visit and why their vision can be improved with scleral contact lenses. If there's a topography, I will send them the topography. I also do specular microscopy on a lot of my patients, so I will send them the results of that, just so that they know that we're providing a very high level of service for this patient and that they truly do need scleral lenses. Next, you'll be putting in their current uh, eyeglass information and, and also the vision in their right and left eye, and then the contact lens information. And this is where it's, it's kind of confusing to me because you almost have to do the contact lens fitting to really know what the contact lens prescription will be and then also what the vision is going to be. And then you put your professional fee in, so that's for the fitting and then your material fees, and then you just click the contact lens area there. So you just put in all of your fees, and then they will review it, and then send it back with any edits, or they might approve the whole amount that's requested. It's kind of at the discretion of the optometrist that's reviewing the chart. So billing to medical insurance, you can bill contact lens services and materials to medical insurances, but reimbursement rates vary and they depend on the actual insurance carrier. If you do bill scleral lenses or scleral lens cover shells that are billed to Medicare, that will need to be billed to durable medical equipment. And that's really important because for the longest time we were billing these codes to Medicare and we kept getting rejected. But once we started billing them to durable medical equipment, then we started to get paid. So I'm just going to answer a few questions before we move on here.
Okay, here's a question on if how do you bill VSP for specialty contact lenses if the patient has high astigmatism or irregular astigmatism? Is it considered medically necessary? Um, if the patient has high astigmatism, I don't think that they qualify at least on that specialty maximum code that I showed you, that list. Um, irregular astigmatism is not considered a code that you can use to bill for uh, the specialty maximums. You actually have to indicate why that patient has irregular astigmatism. So you have to use the code as um, you know, maybe they had a transplant and that's what's causing their irregular astigmatism. Maybe they have a corneal scar and that's causing the irregular astigmatism. So you actually have to indicate why they have it, not just that they have irregular astigmatism. That used to be the case, of, I think, a couple years back, but they have changed that. You cannot use that as a, as a code anymore. Let me just take a couple other questions here. Um, How is the billing done if they need more follow-up visits and they are out of the lump sum period? Well, that is going to depend on the agreement that you have within the carrier. So let's say for VSP, the, the, follow, the fitting and follow-up is for 90 days. Well, if anything's going on with that afterwards, that would have to be at your usual and customary f fees. And I'm not sure because each... Um, uh, carrier is different, so their time period might be different, or they may not even have a specific time period. I usually have all patients sign a little contract that says this period is covering um, your lenses, the fitting, the dispense, the follow-up for this many days. After this period, if there's any problems, it will have to be billed as like an office visit, something to that nature. Okay, so I'm going to move on and we'll be answering some more questions later. This is something interesting. These are just the Medicare reimbursement rates and I got these all from codesafeplus.com which is a very up-to-date site on Medicare reimbursements, medical reimbursement rates. It's a really amazing site and I use it a lot. So for 92072, which will be a common um, code for you to use if you are billing medically, the maximum reimbursement for that is $135.06. And this is, keep in mind, this is all information from January, so things may have changed just slightly. Billing to Medicare, you can bill the V2531. But remember, we do have to bill it to DME. So here are the um, ceiling and floor values. So the ceiling value for the V2531 is 622.47, and then the floor value is 466.85. And of course, the insurance um, payments vary depending on the region that, that you live in. You can also bill a scleral cover shell, which is V2627, in the event that you are fitting a scleral lens for dry eye. The ceiling value for this is about $1,600, and then the floor value is about $1,200. So you would bill that um, as your usual and customary rates, but these are the ceiling and floor values. This is something that I got from um, the CMS website from you know, Medicare, and it talks about scleral shells and what they can be used with. And this is probably the most important thing that I got from it, is that scleral shells are used in combination with artificial tears in the treatment of dry eye. And that's basically where the lacrimal gland is, is failing and it's not able to produce enough tears for the eye. So the lens on the bottom sentence there acts as a substitute in part for the functioning of the diseased lacrimal gland and will be covered as a prosthetic device in the rare case when it is used in the treatment of dry eye. 
So if you are going to use scleral cover shell, it can only be used for dry eye etiology, it cannot be used for refractive. My tips if you are going to use scleral cover shell is to perform any dry eye testing that you may have within your clinic so that you can document your medical necessity. So in the case if you were ever audited, you would be able to prove that this patient does have a tear film insufficiency. One of the things you might do may be a dry eye questionnaire. If you use Shermer's or the phenol red thread test, this is what I use for every patient if I'm going to do V2627 to prove that they do have um, a tear film insufficiency. You can also do lysamine green staining and take photos. You can also have fluorescein staining, maybe take photos to document that and any other anterior segment pictures to show that this patient truly has a dry eye. And then also documenting the tear breakup time. And if you have a tear osmolarity unit, I personally do not have one, but if you have that, maybe that will help you as well, just to document the medical necessity. This is really important. Please take a picture of this. I struggled for months to figure out why we were not getting paid for scleral cover shells, even though I had read articles online and I felt like I was billing things appropriately. And it, it's just we, we were not billing it to the right place and we were not using the, the right codes. But now that I have uh, used the appropriate codes and the modifiers, we have been getting paid um, very easily. So. Just please save yourself time and headache and just learn from my mistakes here. This is the most important area here, and I'm just going to blow that up for you. So the procedure code would be the V2627. Then you will separate that from the I that you perform the service on, and then KX, which indicates that this is a medically necessary code. And don't forget, you have to bill this to DME. They will not pay for it under regular Medicare. So please make sure you write this down. This will help you tremendously um, get paid. And in this case, you do bill each eye separately. So I separate it into V2627, right KX, and then also V2627, left KX. So you definitely can build them, um, each eye separately. And then I'm going to take a couple more questions here. So one of the questions is what happens if you're not a DME provider? So you won't get paid. You have to be a DME provider, otherwise you cannot bill scleral cover shells to Medicare. You just won't get reimbursed. Other questions are, is this webinar going to be available afterwards? Yes, we are recording this, and in the future, I will have this up on the sclerolens.org website for you all, and then we'll try to email you a link, um, anybody that attended the webinar or at least signed up for the webinar, and then you can click on that and follow that. Some of my final thoughts. Billing scleral lenses to vision insurances and medical insurances do not, does not have to be difficult if you use the right codes. Of course, insurance reimbursement rates, they do vary drastically. You know, from the vision insurances, um, each of them vary drastically. So some of them may only reimburse you $250 total for the fitting and the lenses. Others may reimburse, you know, up to thousands of dollars. So each insurance is completely different. Each patient is completely different as well. 
Make sure you price your scleral lens fees appropriately based on the amount of time that you spend with the patient and the amount of um, supplies and equipment. This lecture will be available as a recorded webinar on sclerolens.org in the future, and I hope you find this very helpful, especially step-by-step -step how to build scleral lenses. And of course, I wish you much success with scleral lenses. So next time, we are going to have another amazing lecturer, Dr. Jason Jedlica. He is awesome. He is going to talk about marketing and growing your scleral lens practice. And that is going to be on Wednesday, November 4th. And it will be the same time as we have now, which will be 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So thank you for your attention. Um, if you have any more questions, please feel free to keep putting them in the question box, and we will try to get back to you as, as many as we can after the webinar. And thank you so much for your attention, and I know this is a tedious topic, and, and I really hope that you learned something. The Scleral Lens Society is always here for, for you to, to ask any questions, and our goal is to really help practitioners be successful with scleral lenses. So please take advantage of all the resources that the Scleral Lens Society has to offer. Thank you very much, and have a nice evening.